Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here, as always, with Tom or Tom. How is it going? Tony, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and then, boom, big payoff. You ask me how I'm doing. So now I'm great. I, I wasn't sure I wasn't sure where that was going, but now I know. I, I'm, I'm truly grateful to you for asking, because I know it's coming from a good place and not just because you want me to, you know, put the pressure on me to open the show with something interesting and not put that pressure on yourself. So I, I appreciate your genuine interest, and I would like to say I'm outstanding, buddy. How are you? I I don't have time for that, Tom. No, actually, Tom, I, there are times where I'm like, you know what? I honestly don't care how he's doing. I don't think I'm going to ask this time. But I'm like, no, no, no. He'll get upset. He'll storm off. We don't need that. I just want to get this stuff done, get it recorded. That way we can get it set up. I, I, I don't want to the, – the, the storming off, and then I, I got to call. I'll call Kevin. Like, hey, Kev, Tom's done it again. He's not coming out of the, you know, yeah, he's 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 not coming out of the basement. He's just really upset. Can you call him? And Kevin, of course, Kevin knew to be like, no, I'm not calling him. He can just cry. And so then we just got to let you get over your feelings for a while. And then we record. And then uh, then I remember like, hey, how's it going? And then you go like, not good. Let me tell you why. And then you just rehash all of the stuff that we made you upset about. And so uh, that's a lot of times why I don't want to ask. But I end up doing it so that I don't have to then ask later when you're even more upset. So how's it going? I forgot. I, I, I think I just want to correct you on one thing. You said mm-hmm. you, you don't want me to storm out. You don't want me to storm out again. That's that's the only thing. Yeah, yes. Just that, that. Other than that, I had no no quarrels with any of that. Uh, <laughs> yes, Tom. Please stay. <laughs> no, you can't go. All the plants will die. Uh, first one from Matt <laughs> Joel, Jay Ballenbacher. Uh, who are two names that could be breakout stars on the new defense, and why? Tony, I feel like we could just kind of reprise our uh, all of our conversations about the Leo position here, uh, but uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on uh, if you have someone specific to uh, specific to the defense that you think uh, might be a good breakout star. Well, and I touched on it in the first listener question show that we did on Tuesday, and I might go back to Josh Proctor on this one, a guy who has been on the cusp, on the cusp, and now could really be something in this defense where you are getting more pressure on the quarterback. That kind of makes life a little bit easier on a free safety. Can maybe swoop in and grab a couple of interceptions. Remember early in his career, he was a guy that was known for finding the football while it was in the air. And he was also known for kind of maybe dropping a couple of interceptions. If he holds on to those, he still has his nose for the football, still has his knees for the football. He's a guy that could be a breakout star this year. And then since you're asking for a second one, I'll probably take the easy way out and and go to the defensive line. But I'm not going to go with the Leo, Tom. I'm going to go with a guy that nobody's talking about, nobody's ever heard of, JT Tui Mulawal. He's a freshman last year. I know a lot of people didn't see him. But uh, significant, significant upside. I think while everybody is looking at the flashy thing, the flashy Leo, You've got this JT Tui Moloa who's just going to be a monster and uh, really uh, wreck some havoc as well. I think he's a good a good uh, potential uh, answer there. I think you could kind of pick any of the you know the Leos or the linebackers or the defensive line because I think you're going to have a lot more productivity out of a lot of those roles just in terms of like bigger numbers because you're potentially confusing the offensive line. You've got got you know offensive lineman blocking no one and someone's coming clean. Like you're going to if if you can confuse the defense a little more, and that is obviously something Knowles is really setting out to do, you could have much bigger numbers uh, from some guys year over year. So I, I I like both of those picks. I mean Proctor Proctor, someone who I would have picked as a potential breakout last year, and obviously had that that you know serious leg injury against Oregon, and then didn't really get a chance to keep playing. So he's he's a good pick, but yeah, I think I think you could pick Zach Harrison. I think you could pick JT Tuimolo out. I think you pick Jack Sawyer. You could pick Kate Stover. You could pick. Uh, I, I think Steel Chambers is a potential answer there. I mean, you, you've got you've got a lot of good, uh, a lot of good potential options there. But yeah, I, I I think your your two picks are both absolutely reasonable answers. All right, next one. For, next Thank one you. from at bag f underscore e. Um, gray sleeves on the jerseys. Why are they resisting this? And 
you know how you you know the best baseball is the baseball that was played when you were eight years old like the whatever the major leagues were like back then that's like your platonic ideal of baseball i feel like when you really become a fan of a team like that's how well why don't they you know they should they should do everything like that they should they should uh you know everything was better before and every change since then has ruined it and so you know the gray sleeves on the jerseys that's what they had when i started paying attention to them so therefore in my brain it's like this is what they should look like so i, I get it i although i feel like the fact that they save those jerseys for college football playoff appearances is an indication that they also know that those are the best jerseys so uh here's how things work in college athletics uh, at some point, this is this is something you learn if you follow European soccer as well. They redesign the kits, which is uh, the uh, uh, the British word for jerseys and uniforms. So you, uh, yes, I know. Uh, they they redesign the kits every year so that then, well, I have to buy a new kit because they have a new shirt sponsor and the, and the kit looks different and I, and I don't want to be the guy with the kit from two years ago. So, you know, Ohio State doesn't do that. They've kind of kept it consistent. But this year, you're going to introduce names on the backs of the jerseys, it sounds like, that that's potentially coming. So if you can, uh, you know, you can buy your C.J. Stroud jersey, you can buy your Travian Henderson jersey, and uh, with the name on the back and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, that gets you a bunch of jersey sales this year, next year. It feels like you wait another couple of years, and then you introduce the gray sleeve jerseys back, and then everyone's like, well, now I can't, I can't use the old jerseys anymore. It has the old players' names, names and numbers on it. And even if I did, ca you know, don't care about that, well, it's got the old sleeve strap, so then I got to buy the new jersey, and, and uh, it'll sell uh, sell more merchandising. So, you know, I don't I don't know when their deal with Nike is up, but potentially that's something that uh, if you can, uh, you know, work into your next deal with Nike, like hey, you, you'll get more money if we uh, can design a new jersey. Um, you know, maybe that's uh, maybe that's the uh, that's the answer. I think what I'm hearing is that Ohio State should go back to champion. <laughs> I think that's, you know, I don't know if New Balance uh, is still available. I know New Balance. New Balance used to just do, I think, like the University of Maine and um, who was Georgia Tech? Georgia Tech was someone. Were, uh, it wasn't. Uh, were they? Were they champion? Georgia Tech was someone weird for, like, they were the only ones who were that mm -hmm. Jersey manufacturer. It wasn't Voight. It wasn't uh, <laughs> Puma. <laughs> pony, get, bring back the red ponies oh, for Ohio man, State. Yeah. I'm okay with that one. Yeah, but uh, the gray sleeves for me, uh, I think it's kind of like uh, the iPhone, where Apple can't give you everything you want, or else you won't buy the next phone. It's a lot like what you said, where yeah, we know you want it, but if we give it to you, then then what else can we do? I do wonder. I have not bought any of these. Uh, customizable jerseys do they sell the alternates as well i think that would be a, you know i want the black one i want this one i want the one that they use in the playoffs because that would be a, a way to get the the gray sleeves and or do they say no we'll only make these few available for now and then uh, you just you just keep holding off you can't give everybody what they want or else they'll stop wanting i guess and then then you have to come up with new accessories like you know Malibu Stacy and, and, and Smithers and all of that stuff. Invent a new holiday. Love day when you buy your, your you buy, buy your loved ones a new Ohio State jersey. Uh, next one from at 911 Pool Rescue. As good as boy, that sounds like an awesome TV show. Like it like not a basic cable, but like an extended like this is what true TV airs when it's not uh, when it's not uh, NCAA basketball time. It's just the uh, impractical jokers and uh, 911 pool rescue i would i would watch the heck out of that show I, I do have a question are these pools that are in trouble that's a good question well is, yeah are you saving people for inside pools or is this like bar rescue where you're saving you know like failing no, bars? I'm saying, are you saving a pool like pool is being like it's choking on a mm. hot dog and you've got to go save the pool you got a cannonball off of the diving board to that's how you perform that's how <laughs> you perform a heimlich on a swimming pool not many people know that I don't know. I don't know that you really need to be a professional for this. I mean, you just need to be a guy. Can you displace liquid with your body? Well, yes, I can. You're hired. So anyway, speaking of uh, displacing things, uh, as good as Trey Van Henderson is, do you see him making the first man miss more than this year after one year of college coaching? 
that's an oh sorry you, you it's your turn you go ahead and answer <laughs> that's fine oh, oh i will make a bold prediction mm-hmm. Yes, he will make more dudes miss. The first man missed more. And I, I think a lot – he went through some growing pains last year and, and, and was really good early on. And then I, I've said before, I think he kind of took it to heart or to maybe too much to heart about how he had to run tougher and stronger and you've got to fight for those yards. And so I think maybe sometimes he went looking for the fight rather than looking to avoid it where you've got a guy like Mayan Williams who has no problem fighting – but that first guy doesn't really get to fight a lot because he makes him miss. And so you see some of the successes that he had, and, and you realize, you know what, if I just don't let that guy hit me, then I don't have to worry about it as much. And remember, uh, in the, I think it was the spring, because Trevion Henderson didn't play his senior year. He said, like, just in talking about practice, I just need to get hit once, and then I'll be ready to go. Whereas Evan Pryor was like, yeah, I'm not trying to get hit by anybody. Like, I don't – why would I want to get hit? And so maybe maybe Trevion Henderson will will borrow some of that, but I do expect him to be better. I don't know how much, but I expect that first guy to uh, not be as um, uh, maintain as much contact with Henderson this year as they did last year. But also last year, it, 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 there were so many simple runs that he had. You, you couldn't make the first guy miss. I think you change that up a little bit, and that's going to help as well. And another thing that might change this answer a little bit is I think I'm assuming that this is a better offensive line in terms of run blocking than it was last year because you have the four, you know, the four tackles last year, and and you know that was a you know it was a little bit of an experiment, and it you know it worked out reasonably well. But there were times when they were fifty something in uh, basically short yardage situations, you know. Third and two, fourth and two, fourth and one, third and goal from the two. They were 50-something in the nation in that, which is, like, okay. But that was one of the areas where they really, you know, relatively struggled on the line was those short yardage situations and just the, the, you know, run blocking in very obvious run situations, which is something that Justin Fry talked about. On third and two, he wants everyone in the stadium to know where the ball's going and for them to still be able to do it. So, and, you know, you, you replace a Thayer Munford with a Matt Jones at left guard, that might help um, with some of that, you know, some of that stuff. So, if those guys are blocking, and you get, you know, you get a little more push, the holes are a little bit bigger, and you know, you just get you get a guy up to that second level where you just maybe even just chip someone, you know, where they don't have a completely clean shot at you. You might have more guys missing just as a result of that as well, in addition to whatever um, you know personal improvement that uh, Travian Henderson has this off season. Uh, next one. <laughs> Man, we, we've got some great usernames in this one from at potato shirts. Tony, are the shirts, do they have shirts with pictures of potatoes? Or are the shirts made of potatoes? Is this like a potato? Is that like the media gift at the potato bowl? What do you, what do you think? These are, these are shirts for potatoes. Mm, like, like Mr. Mr. Potato had clothes. Yeah. I, you've got shirts for dogs. I think the next big thing, clothing for vegetables, tubers, pumpkins, gourds, whatever. And, uh, you know, then, you know how, like, the potatoes, they've got the eyes that grow out. That can be their arms and their legs. Um, fun for hours, fun for all ages. Yes, uh, shirts for taters. Although, and the fun thing, Tom, the same size shirt that would fit a potato would also fit uh, a, a tate. <laughs> I have nothing to add. Uh, so anyway, so at Potato Shirts ask, what's the best non-obvious fringe benefit of working the Ohio State beat? Is there an interesting fact about Ohio Stadium that you all have access to that would surprise the general public? There's a couple good answers here uh, beyond just sometimes we get paid to travel to West Lafayette, Indiana and Champaign, Illinois. Sometimes, I mean, that's that's obviously the first answer. But um, I, I think my favorite part of being on the beat, and this is going to be kind of counterintuitive. Like, I mean, like, yes, being on the field at the Rose Bowl was objectively cool. Like, that was a really, that is a very cool experience. You get to do stuff like that where you, you know, get to do, you know, be be right there in the mid, you know, as history is happening five feet away from you. Like, that's, that is objectively cool. I feel like that's kind of the obvious answer here. So uh, I think one of the non-obvious answers is being in those places before and after the game. Like before, you know, when there's 90,000 people in the Rose Bowl and the game's going on, like, yeah, that's cool. It's a, you know, the greatest spectacles in all the sports. Being in the Rose Bowl 
three hours before the game, before they open the gates to anyone else, being in the Rose Bowl three hours after the game when the stadium's over and, you know, the stadium's empty and everyone's gone and it's just, you know, cups and uh, popcorn boxes and stuff in the stands blown around. Um, it, it's just kind of cool to be in there because it's just, it's a really uh, interesting um, comparison of this quiet, peaceful place that gets completely nuts for like three hours, three and a half hours, sometimes four hours, uh, and then is just like silent again afterwards and it's quiet and then, uh, you know, there's no one there. Th that always has just been kind of like a cool, different thing to me. Um, as far as stuff about Ohio State that we have access to that would surprise the general public, let's see. Um, the, I, I have done a series on like behind the scenes at Ohio Stadium because we try and show you guys this stuff. You can find if you search behind the scenes at Ohio Stadium on the Buckeye Scoop YouTube channel, you can see videos of all this stuff because we know, you know, you guys generally don't get to go in the tunnel that the Buckeyes come down or in the secret room underneath South Stands or whatever it is. So we try and show you guys some of that stuff. Um, the the photo bunker under South Stands, like basically right underneath where the marching band sits, there's a room and it's just basically like a long concrete hallway almost where there's like picnic tables set up and then the cheerleaders have stuff down there and you know that's where they store the big flags and they have the old goal posts down there and all that kind of stuff but that's where the photographers work there's just like this small room underneath south stands that's kind of different uh, i got to go up to the victory bell last year uh after one of the games and uh got to uh, shoot some video up there that was pretty cool that was that was something that i had on my list at some point and uh so that was that was a pretty cool uh different different kind of spot. That's uh the Victory Bell is um like you hear it and you see it sticking out the side of the stadium. When you go up there, it's like that whole room is just full of like HVAC equipment. Like I think that's where they have the HVAC stuff for all the suites and all that stuff. So it is like a really cramped, dirty kind of, of area. You kind of have to like wind your way and squeeze through different things um to get around to the Victory Bell, but that was uh that was pretty cool. That that might be the best answer to uh, uh, the interesting fact about Ohio Stadium that you you know that would surprise the general public is like you think of the Victory Bell and it's like oh it's this huge you know this huge thing and no it's just it's a tiny little area where you uh, you have to kind of squeeze around HVAC equipment to get uh, to get there. What Tony? What's what is the best the, non-obvious fringe benefit of working the Ohio State beat other than getting to hang out with me? Uh, a campus-wide parking pass. Oh, that's a good answer too. Let, let, let you put. Park anywhere you essentially anywhere you want on campus within within reason. If it says reserve for President Christian Johnson, like you know, Christine Johnson, don't don't park there. Like anywhere else, pretty much free game. I, I do remember the first time, and I wasn't I was a college student, but I had a buddy who was a, a producer at Channel Six, and he had a, a parking pass, and I used it for my senior finals. I parked right in front of the, the classroom rather than as you know parking somewhere in, in a parking lot and taking the bus it's like no i've got a parking pass i am the most powerful man on campus <laughs> i'm i'm gonna park right in front of the building so that's that's one of them i the the bunker that you mentioned it, it's you know every uh, little league practice field has like the the shed with all of the equipment and the bases mm -hmm. that's like what that is for, <laughs> for ohio stadium <laughs> and it also has a, a porta potty uh but uh, you know that i think um one of the interesting things about Ohio Stadium, as you travel to all of these different other stadiums, including NFL stadiums, is how much bigger stuff is in Ohio Stadium than other places. The like the visitors uh, media area, which at some places is about the size of a living room, uh, not a, not a big living room. Even the, the Cincinnati Bengals road media, we were there for spring game. I don't know, 2015, 16, whatever it was. And it was small as heck. And, and Ohio State is just bigger. All of the stuff is bigger than everywhere. It's not necessarily better. It's something like Indiana's post game is basically like a classroom in the stadium. And, it, and it's nice. And uh, it's got tables and everything. But um, it, there's some really small, cramped areas around the Big Ten where it's, it's so bad that – you can't even necessarily get everybody into the room. And it's like you've got half of the Ohio State beat, which is gigantic, and then the rest of the half is just like, hope I'm not missing anything as they bring bring players out for you to talk to. I think 
just the the immensity of Ohio State and all things, the size of the beat and everything is uh, is eye opening as you go to other places. Yeah, for sure. I, Northwestern is one that sticks out to me, where it's just like you, you know you, you walk into the room and it's like, oh, this is going to be one of these clown car situations where you know there there are more Ohio State media here than there are Northwestern media, and Northwestern is the home team. So why don't you just give us the home media room and uh, the Northwestern beat, all three of them can take the visiting media room where they can actually all fit. How about that? Can we do that? No? Okay. Well, I guess we'll... All right. Well, everybody uh, everybody, hold your breath and squeeze through this door. We'll all fit in together. Ready? Go. <laughs> yeah. It, the the variety of uh, media setups in different, different schools is definitely a surprise. Um, I feel like Rutgers, we end up doing stuff just out outside on the field half the time. Uh, talking to players outside in the field because it's like, well, there's not, you know, there's not enough room to have uh, multiple players out here. So, you know, they, you'll have different different setups like that. But yeah, that's a, that's a good one as well. Ohio State has done a lot to improve their media facilities over the last few years. They put new lighting in the post game room and you know put new new decor in the post game room and really uh, dressed up the press box. So, yeah, they, there's a you know the size of the Ohio State press box as compared to say the Penn State press box. That's another thing that's. Uh, Penn State's press box was uh, built by, uh, you know, uh, you know, no, Donald Pennsylvania back in. I think 19- it was the Masons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Donald Pennsylvania back in 1756. It was the, the first building in the state of Pennsylvania and uh, the first building with indoor plumbing. But you have to, uh, you know, it's the old toilet with the chain up here that you know, like on uh, in the Godfather where they hide the gun up. The, yeah, it's, um, mm-hmm. yeah, it's. Uh, it is quite a uh, quite a fun place. They have it does come with pool noodles though, so you don't whack your head on the beams. Uh, Tony and I are both rather tall, and it is uh, it is a little dicey every time you're in that Penn State press box to not hit your face on a beam. I'm not sure if people really like think we're joking about that. No, it's just <laughs> imagine like walking into where your basement just isn't tall enough to be like a, a livable, workable basement, and you have to like walk like this, and it's it. It can be jarring and literally and, and figuratively where you've got these metal beams that uh, have foam on them so that you don't concuss yourself. And uh, it's, it's, it's a real thing, and, it, and it, it's dangerous. And uh, I'm sure they're going to get right on uh, fixing that press box at some point. In, um, Good. Good. I mean, Michigan's press box used to but, be kind of like that. It was nicer than the Penn State one, but it used to be kind of like that. And they replaced that one, what, 15 years ago? I mean, it's probably been... It might have been 2001 was the last time. It was either 2001 or 2003 was the last time uh, I was up there in the old press box. So yeah, it is. Uh, they, you know, they, they, there are and then and then like Michigan State's press box is super nice. Michigan State just redid their uh, their mm-hmm. facilities. Purdue's press box is pretty nice. Uh, so yeah, there's there are uh, there's a wide variety of uh, facilities in all the uh, all the different uh, Big Ten stadiums. And the reason at Penn State why. Tom, you know why they can get away with this? It's because of all of the free ice cream mm-hmm. and the <laughs> they usually have like some top top five Big Ten mm-hmm. meals that they provide for the media. So it's like, yeah, well, it's like, they know how to keep people happy, mm-hmm. even as they put them in danger. We're, we're fine being put in danger as long as there's all of the ice cream we can eat and, you know, 16 different kinds of sausages and whatnot. <laughs> Uh, all right, so next one uh, from at Matthew Casale 3. Uh, at this point, do you see the Ohio State football program adding players via the portal? If so, which position would they be most likely to add? Yeah, I, I, I think they're going to keep looking. I think you, obviously everybody's going to keep looking, and whether somebody pops up, that's that's the bigger question. I know they were looking at a tight end earlier. Ryan Day said they're okay right now. They've got five tight ends. That's what they want, and that's with Kate Stover staying on defense. But those five tight ends have a, a career total of like I don't know four catches or something like that. So there's there's not a lot of uh, production there. So you don't know exactly what you have. But by the time you figure it out, it's too late anyway. So if, if you're going to go with five, then you know you're, you're just going to go with what you've got now, or you're going to try to bring somebody in before you know that you don't have enough. Like you you have to make that decision by the end of after spring, I guess. And I, I do wonder. For one, they would have to have room, and they they are going to be losing some players. They're at what we have we decided it's ninety two right think, now. Yeah, so. Ninety two is where we landed. Yeah. So to to really add somebody, they have to lose eight guys, and they they can if they need to or or want to. Um, but it sure seems like things have quieted down on the transfer portal front. But this is also the time of year when it will. 
because then as players find out where they exist on the, the depth chart in the spring, then they transfer out in the spring, after spring. But then guys leaving after the spring because they're not going to play somewhere, what what makes you think that they could play at Ohio State? Right, yeah. I mean, Ohio State has a very, very narrow uh, selection of players they can, you know, that, that would really materially create an upgrade for them. Because the, the talent on the roster is pretty good just about everywhere, and you don't have, like, a really gaping, obvious problem where it's like, oh, no, we don't have a kicker this year. Like, you've got, you have all, you know, you, you have all of your basic needs met, and the replacement level at Ohio State is pretty darn high, so you're not just going to pull some random schlub off of a, you know, Sunbelt roster and just immediately be able to plug him in at Ohio State. It's going to have to be, like, a really remarkable t- player from that level. And they, they have chased players like that they they went after someone from Florida International an offensive lineman Florida International Florida Atlantic one or the other uh earlier this off season didn't didn't end up getting him but you know th- they're going to kind of keep their eyes open and you know keep an eye out for guys who might fit in a couple different spots you know maybe an offensive lineman maybe a tight end yeah i i feel like they're probably reasonably well set most other spots so i don't i don't think i you know i you know I would say less than fifty fifty that they bring someone else in. Still a possibility, but there's just there's a lot of variables there. Who's who's in the portal that would, uh, you know, would would fulfill a uh, a need for Ohio State? Um, a related question uh, from uh, at Don I. Uh, you think any players could still hit the transfer portal after spring ball? And uh, the answer to this question starts with what Tony mentioned earlier. They're at ninety two, so I'm going to say spoiler alert. The answer is yes. Uh, a number of players are going to hit the portal after spring ball, and and that's that's going to be true at every program in the nation. I, I legitimately do not think there will be a program in anywhere in America that does not have a player hit the transfer portal after spring ball, because spring is when you have what we what we euphemistically refer to as the spring awakening, which is you're a uh, third year player, a fourth year player. And uh, you come into the spring, it is going to be an exciting new year. This is the year you are going finally going to do it. You're finally going to break into the starting lineup or the two deep. And then it's like, oh, these new guys are also pretty good at football. And, uh uh-oh, now I'm getting passed in the depth chart by guys behind me. I might not ever play here. I'm going to go somewhere else to play. That happens every year at every program in the country. And now that the transfer portal, you get the one-time transfer exception, the transfer portal makes it even easier to kind of coordinate that kind of stuff. So, and it's like, I feel like there's not really a stigma around it anymore. Like, I think that at times in the past, there was something of a stigma that you're quitting on your team and, and all that kind of stuff. It feels like that's less true now than it has been at any point in the past. With the one-time transfer exception, there's really, you know, there's, you don't have the penalty attached to it that you did before. So, yeah, I would, I, I would fully expect Ohio State to have five to seven guys in the portal. And, you know, we, we have a policy that we don't speculate on specific names, which that's, you know, that, that, that's only fair to the players involved. But I would, I would expect you're going to see a number of guys in the portal because these are very high level athletes these if you got a scholarship to play football at Ohio State you were a good football player that is just kind of like Ohio State does not recruit a lot of bums that is just kind of how it works so if you are a high level football player you want to play football and if you kind of figure out like hey that might not be happening here you're going to want to go somewhere to do it and i think that the 5 to 7 is probably about the number i'm just i was thinking in my head like what's the average? Like I think every team, all 130 of them, should probably plan to lose like five mm-hmm. guys. Like that's like the baseline, and so that's another six or seven hundred players in the transfer portal. I, I heard this week that there's two thousand in there right now, and that's in, in the six to seven hundred is just from the the FBS levels that will get added. As I'm saying, you know, five per team, and that that may be low. It's probably going to be low for Ohio State, and it's going to be low for a lot of programs who. We'll need to bring players in, and, and they'll be pushing players out, and it's just it's 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 a give a penny take a penny situation <laughs> for a lot of programs where you're like, okay, we'll bring you in, and, and now we're going to ship you off. And, it, and I've said this before, they have uh, coaches have uh, been able to take this uh, uh, roster management that used to be so vilified and, and frowned upon, and they've been able to switch it into a, a power play for the players, and it's to uh, allow those players to realize their full potential and grasp their futures. And and really, I think a lot of coaches will complain about it because they don't want players leaving, but it has also made it easier for them to push players out. Yeah, it it does feel like there's a little, there is a self-serving element to this for sure, where 
it, it does let coaches solve problems in a way that you know that where the coaches aren't necessarily the bad guys where they're when they're solving the problems but it's like you know the transfer portal is fine no not for you 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 have to stay here but the transfer portal is fine for you and you and you that's that's uh, that's what it's here for it's for freedom of movement not you though you stay you, you stay right there mister mm-hmm. do not leave like they have an invisible fence around the football facility or something yeah it's a uh, it, it is something that has kind of changed the conversation around uh transferring a little bit so that's uh that, that is a very different uh very different thing but yeah I, I would i think that's just kind of for the time being, you're going to just, that is going to be the new norm is going to be five to seven guys. I mean, there were, there were programs that had 20, I think Hawaii had 20 guys transfer after the season. I mean, and that's, that's a kind of unique situation, but they're not the only program that has had 15, 20 guys leave after the season. So that's just kind of the new, the new norm. All right. Last one from at Hanning underscore C. Tony, was Danny Glover good in Predator 2? Tom, Danny Glover was surprisingly good in predator two and i know people are back then even were saying how can you replace arnold schwarzenegger with danny glover in a sequel and i will remind them it wasn't the first time Uh, danny glover also replaced arnold schwarzenegger in twins too so (laughs) but uh in all seriousness i I don't is is that true i feel like that can't possibly be true (laughs) that's that's not true (laughs) but predator two is true and it's a it's a decent movie for the time and when i say it's a decent movie for the time it's a bad movie now yes of course <laughs> uh would it have been better with steven seagal obviously but it's it, it it does the job it's a predator movie and it's in the city and danny glover is uh, one of these movies where you know you know tom like danny glover is too old for this mm. and he knows it and that's the frustrating part for him mm-hmm. but he's going to get the job done uh, one of my complaints that I have with Danny Glover is that uh, so much of his dialogue in all of his movies is whisper talking. <laughs> but other than that, it's a fantastic movie. Is that a problem? It's kind of a problem, Tom. Yes, it is. I, I do not like it. <laughs> Predator Two is one that I remember watching it. You know, reasonably when it, around the time it came out, I didn't go see it in the theater, but I remember seeing it on. You know, we may have gone to the old Blockbuster and picked up an mm. old VHS tape to watch uh, Predator Two, and Uphill thinking, "Oh, ways. this is this is going to be uh, this is going to be remarkable because Predator was great and it was in the jungle, and now this is going to be an even better movie set in a different spot." I saw it once. That was probably about 1992, 1993, give or take, and I have not felt compelled to see it again. And I thought, well. Maybe I'm not remembering it right, because there are some movies from back then. I mean, to your point, you know, you don't want to, you know, movies that were good back then are bad now. Uh, I, I remember watching um, uh, Romancing the Stone and then Jewel of the mm-hmm. Nile and thinking both mm-hmm. of those movies were fantastic. And I rewatched them within the last six months. And it was like Romancing the Stone. That holds up pretty well. Jewel of the Nile. Oh, Lord, this is terrible. Oh, this is awful. Why did I like this movie? This is garbage. And uh, so I thought, all right, I'm going to I'm going to check Rotten Tomatoes because I'm. I'm remembering this movie as being like, okay, but not great. Never felt compelled to see it again. Uh, the Tomato Meter, Tony, 30% on Predator 2. Audience score, 44%. It's like, okay, that's not bad. Tony, here is the you might also like for Predator 2. Ready? And you tell me, is this is this the class of movies that you want to hang out with? Robocop mm-hmm. 2. Robocop 2. Mm. Oh, mm. oh, oh, no, mm. no, no. Mm. 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 That's... Mm. Uh, the One which I have no recollection of, but uh, it has a tomato meter of 13%, so I'm sure it's really good. Um, Tony, what if I told you Sharknado, not one, not two, but three. Sharknado three, colon, oh, and I'm going to say, oh, heck. Oh, heck no. Sharknado three, oh, heck no. I mean, that's pretty good. And y- Tony, would you like to guess the Predator two, the tomato meter is 30%. What is the tomato meter for Sharknado 3? I'm going to guess about 12%. 36%. Sharknado no, see, has a is... be- Shark- Sharknado. See, I think Sharknado no. knows what it is. That That, that is no. a Sharknado knows what it is. Now, the one thing that gives me a little pause is Judge Dredd, only 22%. That shows up in, as an also you might also might also like. So uh, that's uh, 22%. I remember Judge Dredd being better than that, but again, I haven't gone back to watch it. Oh, and bad. I really just kind of remember... 
Uh, Janine Turner was the person who uh, was fascinated with the 90s, and then uh, they used seashells for, uh, you know, as as, was, as we no, all might, as we all got close to having to do in uh, March 2020, they used seashells. Now, was that Janine Turner, or was it Sandra Bullock, and, or was Sandra Bullock in Demolition Man? That was Janine Turner, I'm almost positive, was... Uh, but Jennifer. these are all the same... It's all these, the same movie. These, these are all movies that get put into a, a, a three, like, like you've recorded three movies on your six-hour VHS. You mm-hmm. know, it's you've got Judge Dredd, you've got uh, RoboCop, and you've got uh, Predator Two, and and it's it's a great, it's a valuable VHS to have. But uh, mm-hmm. this Sharknado Three, no, it is in no way uh, even in the same realm of a Predator Two. Sharknado, all of it was just pop culture crap it's like the, it was the wordle of sci-fi movies where oh it's it's fun for now but uh and it's it's fun to be fun and it's fun to talk about it nobody likes it nobody watches it it's all just you watch it on twitter it's like a it's 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 one of these the ocho when they show all of these different crazy sports you just watch it for no no good reason predator 2 holds up as a predator movie is it the best predator no is it a top three predator maybe <laughs> <laughs> and it's a it's a franchise that is still going strong, Tom. Still going strong today. Mm. And you, and and the thing is, you could still make that movie today. You couldn't if it was Mel Brooks. <laughs> that's true. I suppose that's true. Yes. Uh, while you were talking, I did go look to check whether that was the Sharknado movie that had the scene at City Field uh, where the Mets play. In fact, that was Sharknado Two. So uh, it does not get any bonus points for including the Mets. Uh, and the other movie that was on the uh, you might also like was Superman three, which all mm. the Superman movies kind of blend together. This one had Richard Pryor in it, yeah, thirty um, yeah, percent. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this is uh, not not outstanding. Is kind of my takeaway from uh, the contextual clues here about uh, Predator two, Superman two, the best of the the Christopher Reeve Superman movies. Just an FYI, I bet you look that up. That's in the eighties on the Tomato Meter, Tom. Please look that up. As I, uh, you got that one. Now, that's the one with Zod and, and everybody because uh, Superman 1, uh, doesn't he? Uh, well, there's so much origin story there and it's it's fine. Uh, another thing, Tom, you got these, uh, you got the Superman has these really old parents and no, nobody was like, gosh, you guys are too old for a kid, like to have a, a baby. Is there, like, you guys are like uh, in, your, in your 70s and you've got this baby. What's up with that? And you didn't go to the hospital for it? But Tom, that's another. Uh, I'm sure the the, the comic book people are, will correct me on that one. But uh, tomato meter, eighty five percent. Superman um, two. Uh, you, you might also you might also like includes the Naked Gun, Doctor yes, No, the course. Italian Job, and Tron. So, and the Italian mm. Job is the 1969 Italian Job. Oh no 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 modern, no, no. not the more modern remake. The the more modern remake is better. Not that I have seen the original Italian Job. I should. <laughs> When the Italian job is on, I us- I'll usually watch it. You- you've got Ed Norton, you've got Mark Wahlberg, you've got Charlize Theron, you've got Jason Statham. You- you- I mean, there- there's just so much there to like, and it's a heist movie. Heist movies, as we all know, one of my favorite genres of movies. Tom, anything else? You had me at Jason Statham, so that's it. It's old. Boom. Perfect. All right, that will do it for this episode. I want to thank everybody for contrib- contributing. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you have any listener questions that you want us to address Ohio State or Jason Statham whichever we will be happy to do that for you guys uh, anytime we can so thank you all for joining us thanks for watching and we will talk to you guys later